I'm Alberto Vasallo. Tonight on Greater Boston, climate activists and local lawmakers are pushing back against the major expansion of Hanscom Airfield in Bedford, which would triple its capacity to hold private jets. Plus, liquor licenses can be hard to come by in the city of Boston, particularly in marginalized communities. Two city councilors pushing for hundreds of new community-specific licenses. Join me ahead. The fight against climate change centered on Bedford this week, where developers are planning a massive half a million square foot expansion to Hascom Airfield. Now, the proposal would build 27 new jet hangars at the airfield, which is publicly owned, but holds the most private jets in New England and would require the removal of dozens of acres of mature trees nearby. Now, protesters rallied outside the State House earlier this week to oppose the expansion as advocates and lawmakers urged Governor Maura Haley to step in. Joining me today uh, is State Senator Michael Barrett of Lexington. He is among the opposers. And joining me along is Chuck Collins, Director of the Program on Inequality and the Common Good at the Institute for Policy Studies, who, has, who did a report, which we want to get into the key findings. But first of all, gentlemen, thank you for, for stopping by. Um, Happy we, to be here. We've got some good time here to kind of let folks know what's going on. But Senator Barrett, tell us. Who's opposed why, and why you're opposed? Okay. Well, I am the Senate chair of the Massachusetts Legislature's Climate Committee. So I uh, worry about these things uh, on an appointment of the Senate president all the time. Uh, this thing is the most single most polluting construction project proposed for Massachusetts, and it happens to be two miles from my house. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, of interest to everyone because these jets will cancel out the kinds of steps we're asking citizens to take to deal with climate change. A, a, a handful of rich people can do uh, as much damage as a million of us can do good. All right, so, so before we get to Chuck in, in the study, explain that a little more because folks who don't know, what is this hang, what are these hangers going to be storing uh, and who are these people that is yeah. gonna be benefiting? Uh, these are the super rich and um, these are essentially garages for their privately owned jets. These are folks who could be flying first class on commercial aircraft in the company of all of us. Uh, and uh, while that's a problem, it's, it's a problem that we all deal with. These folks say, no, I want to fly to Nantucket. I want to fly to Martha's Vineyard. I want to fly to uh, Long Island uh, or to the Bahamas uh, in a way that, that pollutes more than any other okay. form of transportation that exists really in the world. That's what I was going to say. What's wrong with that? And I want to go with Chuck because he's going to tell us what he found in the study. So what's wrong with that, Chuck, if I want to park my jet, which I don't have yet, um, there and some of my friends? Uh, what's wrong with that? What did you find? Well, what we know is that we, the public, subsidize the private jet travel of the ultra-rich. We subsidize it because of these emissions that they're dumping into the air, 10 to 20 times more than the ordinary passenger. We also subsidize their use of the airspace. You know, one out of six flights is a private flight, but they only chip in 2% of the actual uh, costs of the airspace. But in the case of, case of Hanscom, our study looked at who's really using it right now. And we're really talking about uh, the, the region's billionaires, multimillionaires, folks who have other resources and access to other options in terms of transportation, uh, but they're burning up the atmosphere uh, at uh, flying not to business destinations. We found half of these flights, probably more, go to luxury and recreation destinations. Hanscom to Nantucket, Hanscom to Teterboro, the Bahamas, West Palm Beach, so, so Aspen, you get the idea. Yeah, places that they can easily reach using the planes that you and I reach, the flights, right? Easily. And in the case of most of these New England flights, there's other, you know, there's excellent train service, first class train service, uh, ferries, high speed ferries to Nantucket. There are other low emissions options. But, but, but wasn't the part of the reason of the expansion actually to try and cut down on private jet emissions? That's what I had heard and read is the intent or supposedly yeah. what yeah, the proponents... there's a, Listen, Massport is a public agency. They're ultimately, ultimately accountable to elected representatives. So they're, they, they're advancing some climate issues. I've taken a look at their arguments. Remember, I have to worry about climate policy on behalf of the 40 members of the state Senate. I am unconvinced 
by their rationale, they are going to pollute, you know, only four passengers on average travel in one of these private jets on a given flight. So we're talking about planes that carry vanishingly few people, all of them super rich, and they pollute, to Chuck's point, 10 or 20 times more than a passenger on a regular commercial airline. All right, well, Chuck, it kind of doesn't make sense, right? The whole world is talking about climate change right. and preserving this. How do they even get to this point? Who's behind this? Who's, who's you know, who are the proponents of doing this? Well, if you think about it, who flies a private jet? The median wealth of a private jet owner is $190 million. Uh, in Massachusetts, we're talking about John Fish, Herb Chambers, John Childs, the CEOs of Reebok and, and uh, uh, New Balance. These are all billionaires. They are among the most powerful people on the planet. So we have to push back and say, don't expand private jet operations at Hanscom or Logan on a warming planet when you have other choices and other options. Yeah. And, and let, let me just say, uh, because Chuck's absolutely right, uh, these are decent human beings in many cases. They're doing a very bad thing in terms of the interests of the rest of us. So we're pleading with them to fly first class uh, and to leave these private jets alone. Massport is one of the interested parties here. They see an opportunity to cater to the super rich and make a little money in the process. That's a public agency. They're responsible for the greater public interest as well. And as I say, they're canceling out the hard work that we're asking our constituents to do to deal with climate change every day. Insulate your house, buy an EV, think about a heat pump. A uh, handful of people are going to neutralize the efforts of a a hundred thousand of us. So who, who can who can stop this? Who, who, who? Well, uh, there's a board of directors for Massport, which operates Logan as well as Hanscom, right? Uh, now, this is a Charlie Baker board at the moment because their terms don't end when a given governor's mm -hmm. term ends. But I'm a state senator, and my colleagues and I are directing a, a request to this board to do the right thing and to ignore the short-term profitable profit possibilities. Uh, other elected officials, the governor needs to join us to ask them to do the right thing. All of us can increase the pressure. And I'll tell you, if Massport goes ahead, it will suffer more reputational damage in terms of its long-term interests, in terms of its ability, for example, to make a case to the legislature for help on another question. They'll do more damage to themselves than they can profit, uh, possibly profit by in the short term. What role has the community played? What is the surrounding community? You said you live two miles from there, but I've seen there's been public hearings and they're more scheduled. Yeah. What, is the, what are the people around well, saying? Uh, people are very, very upset. Uh, we had a rally in the State House on Monday. Uh, I spoke, Chuck spoke, but perhaps more importantly, residents of the area spoke. And I'll tell you, they're building a coalition which goes beyond Concord, Lincoln, Lexington, and Bedford, the four immediately adjoining towns, all of us want to make sure that these jets don't cancel out the climate policies of the entire state of Massachusetts. So we're building a statewide movement. This is going to be bigger than Massport realizes, I think. This is building very powerfully. Now, I imagine, Chuck, your report is going to be the cornerstone of your argument, right? You've got data that give me some highlights. Give me three highlights of, the, of your key findings that align with what the senator is saying. Yeah, well, one is that 10% uh, of the frequent flyers, the top 20 frequent flyers out of Hanscom burn 10 14% of all the emissions. So we're talking about very wealthy people who are flying almost every other day. Uh, half the destinations to luxury recreation destinations, 41% of the flights less than an hour, 14% less than half an hour. These are regional uh, destinations, Martha's Vineyard, the Hamptons. Basically, we shouldn't blow up in this moment, we shouldn't blow off a carbon emissions bomb when the rest of the society is dialing back its emissions. Yeah. And, and just to, to add to Chuck's point, that's what we have to understand. This is not a, a necessary step to encourage economic development in Massachusetts. I'm very concerned about jobs. I live out on Route 128. We've got a thriving life sciences business, financial services business, tech business. This isn't about that. This is about an, a very large proportion of flights, essentially to avoid the inconvenience of routine travel that the rest of us endure. This is unnecessary travel, and Massport is on the cusp 
of aiding and abetting it for short-term income when it really has a public responsibility to all of us. When you say it's at, at the cusp, what do you mean? What's the time frame? Well, they can What's pull back. Happen? This is not a done deal. Okay. Uh, we're not wasting our time here. Listen, um, Massport hasn't signed on the dotted line, and I'm old enough, and a lot of Bostonians are, to remember the fight against the inner belt, which was going to carve up neighborhoods in Brookline, Boston, Cambridge, Somerville. Highway construction in the 1970s was inevitable. Couldn't be stopped until it could be. Things turned on a dime. A governor named Frank Sargent said no to the inner belt. We're asking Massport to channel its inner Frank Sargent and to say no to this project, and it can do so. What, what role can the governor play other than, you know, take advantage of her pulpit? Well, well, that, uh, that, well that's a powerful role. Uh, she's in the position that I'm in. She can marshal evidence. She can work with folks uh, in the private sector like the Institute for Policy Studies. She can help us build a case. She doesn't have the power to say no, but... Uh, she is, and I think she's inclined to be on the right side, which is to recognize that this is not core economic development. This is frivolous, and it needs to be stopped. Mm. Strong words. Chuck, you agree? I'm, I, I'm with the senator. I hope uh, Governor Healy uh, does the right thing. We should realize this isn't a NIMBY issue. You know, as, as, as a Bostonian, uh, someone who cares a lot about East Boston, we don't want to see accelerated private jet travel in East Boston or anywhere. That's right, and we, that's, uh, he, he makes a good point. We are making common cause with city neighborhoods who don't want to see these wasteful private jets flying in their area either. Mm -hmm. There's a movement here between city people and suburban people, between folks who are just concerned about the planet burning up. This is an opportunity for everyone in Massachusetts to do something about it. And we will be probably hearing more about this um, in the coming weeks. Fair to say? Fair to say? Fair to say. Very right. much. Well, I thank you for coming on the show and uh, bringing, us, bringing us up to speed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you. Liquor licenses are notoriously hard to come by in Boston. Now, they're capped by state law, and the legislature has to sign off on changes, but certain neighborhoods have a lot more trouble than others. In fact, majority black and Latino neighborhoods like in Roxbury, Mattapan, Hyde Park, and much of Dorchester hold a small fraction of the city's 1,000 licenses, despite housing half of the city's population. That's why the city of Boston is pushing for 250 zip code-specific licenses to help fill in the gap. Now, the Boston City Council unanimously approved the licenses earlier this year, and now they're urging the State House to do the same. Two of the councils behind the push, Ruth Z. Luigian and Brian Worrell, join me now. And actually, Brian, you kind of got the ball rolling. You came in as, you know, support. But before that, why the disparity in, in the liquor licenses? Yeah, um, so as a small business owner, uh, one of my focuses was to um, identify barriers to businesses here in the city of Boston. And one of the barriers that we saw was liquor licenses in our neighborhoods because of the cost associated um, with those liquor licenses. Right now in the secondary market, um, the liquor license is going for $625,000. And we know because, you know, we know the disparity studies when it comes to income and medium um, net worth here in the city of Boston that our our local and black owned businesses do not have that capital to compete in the secondary market. All right, so, so let's kind of break it down for our audience, right? The liquor licenses that are available now, that are limited, they're transferable, right? They're assets, the ones that are. So you're saying to acquire one, if you and I wanted to buy a startup bar in JP, we had, and we wanted a liquor license, it would be a, it would cost us about 625,000. Under your, if this goes through, what are the options that we have now? Yes, yeah, so under this restricted license that we're proposing under this home rule mm -hmm. petition, it wouldn't cost you anything. It would cost you to, every year you'd have like uh, annual registration fees. It would be about $3,000, but it wouldn't be a transferable asset. So you'd be able to have a liquor license for your business, be able to, you know, we know that the margins are really slim in the restaurant business and then alcohol sales really do add to the profitability and the viability of a restaurant. And so that's what this would do. But let's say you, that restaurant were to close, um, you don't carry that liquor license with you. It stays with that zip code. And that's one of the really uh, important landmark parts of this legislation. It's recognizing where are the underserved zip codes. We want to make sure that we are bringing vitality, we are bringing uh, vibrancy to these neighborhoods, and we do that in part with these liquor licenses. Yeah, and, and you, you know, you're a small business owner, so, and you talked about it, right? The, the, the margins, profit margins are very slim, right. and liquor license for a restaurant is sometimes Ve it's always very, very important, right? Yeah, and what we saw um, inside, of, inside of some of our studies is that the revenue is two times the amount uh, with 
restaurants that have liquor licenses. And we also know that one in three restaurants don't survive the first year. So on top of all the costs associated, whether it's, you know, a million dollar build out, whether it's stocking, whether it's employees, right? Now we're adding a $625,000, you know, cost to, you know, local uh, businesses that, you know, we know what's when they're doing well, our community's doing well. They're hiring from the employee. They're reinvesting in you know neighborhood organizations. So we want to make sure that we give the tools uh, to our restaurant and local restaurant owners to have the ability to reinvest in our community and then themselves as well to establish not only you know uh, generational wealth but also um, thrive in business districts inside yeah. of the, the neighborhood. So, so you talked about it, right? Generational wealth, small businesses in our community. Um, this was a barrier that. Really Really, we hadn't heard before. Mm -hmm. How did you all say this has got to be a priority, and we we got to do something about this? Well, we actually on this uh, former uh, city councilor Ayanna Presley, now Congresswoman Presley, worked on similar, not exactly the same legislation to provide uh, restricted neighborhood liquor licenses back when she was city councilor. That was effective, but it, one of the things that it did was it, it wasn't strategic in this staggered zip code specific approach. It sort of pitted neighborhood against neighborhood. So Dorchester got some restricted licenses, but then Mattapan got zero. Mattapan, where I was born and raised, they still don't have one restaurant with a liquor license. So I can't recommend to you a restaurant where you can go and have a drink, a beer, or something like that in Mattapan because it doesn't exist. Yeah. This would require, it would, it would be license specific to 02126, which is the Mattapan zip code to help that thrive. You mentioned JP, right? What would you recommend in JP? A lot of the liquor licenses in JP are actually being bought by by chains that are then going to the seaport, right? Because they're the ones who have the capital to be able to pay $625,000. Yeah. So, so let's, let's go over that yeah. again, right? So as it stands now, a liquor license that you pay for, a company can pay for it, they can take it anywhere um, and just leave that neighborhood, yes, right? Exactly. But under this, you can't. Right, this gets tied to a neighborhood, right? So um, the other goal for this was to incentivize, right? Um, restaurant tours to come to those districts that don't have those sit-down restaurants, right? So if you know a, uh, a liquor license is, is in Mattapan or Dorchester, right, you, we're, we're trying to get those businesses, right, to come to those neighborhoods and open up shops so that we can have a place to sit down and enjoy a nice drink. All right, so let's give credit to the Boston City Council because this is a unanimous decision. One of many, right? Um, high five, Councilor. High five, high five, <laughs> high five. <laughs> um, but where does it go from here? Who, who's, you know, what's the next step? Who do we have to convince? Yeah, well, yeah. we both testified with the mayor in front of the state house because there are things that we have to, that what we want to do as a city of Boston, we have to get permission from the state house. So, um, Councilor Arrell has uh, really been leading in that effort. We, the hearing, I think, went well past six o'clock on Monday and it started at one o'clock um, in the afternoon. So, there's a lot of work to do, and we're hoping that our, our colleagues in government and the state house will vote this out of committee favorably because there's such a community need and a desire to get these liquor licenses in the hands of our businesses. Why wouldn't they pass it? Like, wh wh what could possibly bring a no or delay this? I'm hoping that they do pass it and um, they recommend it out of committee favorably, but that's where we need the help of the public to reach out to uh, uh, state representative uh, Taki Chang, who's one of the committee chairs, um, and state senator uh, Cronin as well, um, and, all the, um, and all the other committee members are part of the com uh, licensure committee. Uh, so please, right, if you think that this is something that we do need here, we do need here in the city of Boston, please reach out uh, to uh, State Representative Taki Chang. Mm. How would somebody go about, let's say it goes through, of acquiring the license? Is it an application fee? Is it a lottery? How, how does... How does the person get chosen? Or rest well, th there will be an application fee, and it's going to be, there's still a, the ABC, the alcohol um, mm -hmm. commission here in the city of Boston that has to do the final approval. So it's not just going to be, you get a license, <laughs> and you get, get a license, license no. and you get a license. No, there's going to be, and, no, no, you know, we, we're not, we don't run it that way. Okay. There's an orderly approach to applying and, and availability, and there's a staggered availability every year to also prevent oversaturation in any specific neighborhood. So mm -hmm. this is a really th well thought out way of, of, of making sure that there's balance growth in our neighborhoods, right? And it doesn't put, what, what, one of the things that we didn't mention is at the hearing on Monday, a lot of the people who testified in favor of this home rule petition are folks who actually own those $625,000 really? worth assets because right. it's not, where it's not competing. It's about how do we driving more people into our neighborhoods and they want that too. They want bustling, we want bustling, vibrant main streets in all of our neighborhoods. So who would be opposed? 
I mean, we've heard from a lot of people. We've heard from, you know, um, attorneys um, that practice in this field. We've heard from um, the Massachusetts Restaurant Association who um, um, stood in support of this. Uh, we've heard from, you know, restaurant owners. We heard from the mayor. Uh, we heard from state representatives. Uh, we've heard a large part from a good group of people here in the city of Boston. As of now, there's no one in the city of Boston who's a stakeholder that's opposed to, to this legislation. Mm. So did I hear earlier that if Mattapan uh, gets says you're taking us to dinner? Everyone. Okay. Everyone to dinner and <laughs> your drink record. or cocktail of choice. Okay, good, yes. good, good. I'm not yes. a big alcoholic drinker, <laughs> but I will buy you. Una cerveza. Una cerveza. Una cerveza. cerveza. Yeah, yeah, Una yeah. cerveza. Yeah. <laughs> um, so speaking of that, your, your area, your neighborhood, how, how would that affect your, your particular district? Yeah, so a lot of um, businesses in my district right now are solely takeout. Um, I've spoken to a few restaurateurs that have been operating you know, their business for 18 years without any sit-down options, right? And they want to expand. Uh, they want the ability to hire more people. Uh, they want to be able to show off their, you know, um, cultural cuisines, um, and we also want to drive, you know, some of the tourism dollars here into our neighborhood. So it will talk about growth, talk about more jobs, and as I said, reinvesting into our neighborhood. So I've seen the campaign, the all-inclusive Boston campaign, mm -hmm. which talks about this. This is part of that all-inclusivity, right? Getting lick licenses in these areas for these small businesses. They're all small, mostly all small businesses, right? Restaurants. What is your particular district, for those who don't know? Yeah, so my district is District 4. It's uh, Mattapan. Dorchester, uh, Jamaica, a little bit of Jamaica Plain and Rosendale, but I have Common Square, right? I have a little bit of um, a little bit of Mattapan, um, like going towards uh, Morton Street. So we have like these major, major long corridors, um, Blue Hill Ave, uh, which could be a thriving commercial district, American Legion Highway, Correct. right? So these areas are areas that. I see and the community has seen as areas that could be thriving business districts that we want to make sure that they have the tools with these liquor licenses to be able to bring that bring that bring that foot traffic and bring that attraction to our neighborhoods. So, and you've heard from a lot of restaurant owners in your in your part? Oh, we've heard from a lot. I mean, one of the heartbreaking things is when I got a call from someone who owns a restaurant in Mattapan or in Roxbury, High Park, East Boston, they have a restaurant and they want to have a liquor license and we said, I'm sorry, we don't have any more restricted ones available unless you have 625,000 you want to take out a mortgage so mm -hmm. that you can make this possible and that's just not possible. We don't have that capital often and in our communities, especially in black and brown communities. This is one way of making that possible and really actually addressing the disparities, the racial wealth gap. It does this homo petition does all of that. And so that's one of the reasons why we're just so excited about all of the all of the things that this homo petition brings together. Yeah, and, and again it goes outside just race too. It's like yeah. all these neighborhoods in Boston. Right. Um, there's that, a great there's a great bakery in Jamaica Plain, Third Cliff Bakery. They want the, they want to start this really innovative idea with wine and drinks, but they can't afford the $160,000 liquor license, right? This would make that possible. They could get a restricted license, and then we'll see so much ingenuity, creativity, entrepreneurship based on what is already a popular bakery that wants to expand and offer the community something more. So why not support it? And we've also heard at that testimony, um, at that hearing, testimony from um, restaurant tours that receive one of these non-transferable license and was able to open up another yes. restaurant, right, based because of the low cost these non-transferable licenses have uh, associated with them. So it gives the give the restaurateur an ability to expand um, and to bring their ideas and restaurants to other neighborhoods. Well, I want to thank both of you for kind of giving us more details. I've been seeing it in the news, but hearing it from you guys have really, uh, really given me a better idea, I'm sure the viewers too, of exactly how this works. So thank you for coming by. Thank you. Thank, thank you for right. having us. Thank you. On warm days like these, we can uh, find ourselves looking for the cool shade of a tree. But that's easier to find in some neighborhoods than in others. Advocacy groups Speak for the Trees took GBH News on a community tree walk through Dorchester's Convent Square to see firsthand where we need more of them. Let's take a look. I was kind of disappointed because they, uh, in my complex, they took all the trees down. And I'm asking them, can we have our trees back? Because we breathe better. And I think it was more cheaper to get rid of the trees rather than trim them. So last week, uh, we did our first tree walk here in Cotton Square, and we explored west of Washington Street. Today, we're going to explore east of Washington Street. Uh, we're going to check out where there are trees and where there are not trees.
Trees are inequitably distributed in every major urban area. There's a correlation between tree canopy coverage and historic and continued racist practices like redlining, like disinvestment, white flight. We end up distributing air conditioners because it's so hot, because everyone's like on this heat island, you know, there's a lot of concrete. Oh, well, look at this. This is interesting. You see this letter here? That's the letter T. Tree. Which means that they determine that they're going to plant a tree here. Whether it's going to be tomorrow or next year is anyone's guess. So this is what we call a tree desert. And in a street like this, you'll have summer temperatures anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees hotter in the day. And these neighborhoods actually don't cool down as much at night because the asphalt has absorbed all that sunlight during the day. This is Moultrie Street, and on this side of Moultrie, there are no trees. And if you look to the right, it just says a lot about how we care about communities that don't have a lot. Um, I think it says a lot about agency of when you do have a home and you have a little bit more flexibility to decide what your yard looks like or if you want to plant a tree or if you live in public housing or in areas where there isn't that kind of say. There used to be a tree right there. Now it's a, a piece of asphalt blocking that whole area. be just the city, it can't be just the state. It has to be everyone literally rolling up their sleeves, advocating for trees, advocating for their preservation. For more information on Speak for the Trees, head to treeboston.org. That's it for tonight and come back tomorrow. We'll talk about the renewed fight to change Christopher Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. Good night, everybody.